Welcome to Coming In Hot. Thank you live from Airplay Beach for the intro music. We are recording live from Darling New Media Studios in Midtown SAC. Everybody out there, I am very, very excited to meet this man. I've been working with his team for about two months now and just a great operation. Uh, I'm, I'm proud to be you know, a little part of what they're doing in Northern Cali right now. If you don't know who the hell I'm talking about, we talking about Andrew Monday from local kitchens in the building over Zoom. What up, Andrew? What's going on? Glad to be here. Oh, yeah, man. I Man. So I never met you before, but, you know, Michelle reached out and she was like, hey, I listen to your podcast. Should we do something before we open up? And I was like, of course. And I was like, who's going to be there? Chef Mike, you? No, Andrew's going to be there. He's the talker. So let's 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 go back. Where are you from? How did you get to this local kitchens? Like, tell, tell me everything about you right now. Everybody wants to hear this. Yeah, yeah. Um, so my, my parents live in San Bruno. It's kind of where the airport is at SFO. And went to high school in the city. And then went to college in Denver. Played, played soccer in college. Mm. Um, mostly struggled through school. Probably mm -hmm. wouldn't have gone to college if it wasn't for soccer. Um, and then I think I ended up in startups in the more old school route, more of the kind of misfit route. Like now I think it's, it's kind of hype and like popular and, you know, the kids from all the best schools, they want to like build companies. Yeah. Um, but if you look at the old days, like PayPal in, in days, the garage with wires hanging from everywhere, it's like, it's more like you couldn't get a job somewhere mm -hmm. else. So that's actually, so I worked at DoorDash and that's kind of how I came to DoorDash was basically like, I was the best they could afford, you know? Mm. And, and, and so that's always been kind of my opportunity is if, if you guys have a broom that you need pushed, then, you know, I'll push that shit better than anyone. Yeah. Um, and then I'll, I'll work my way up. So, you know, local kitchens, you know, I'd worked at DoorDash with John. That's kind of how we got together. Okay. And then we wanted to work together for a long time and it just didn't really line up. And then all of a sudden, you know, timing kind of lined up and, you know, all the stars aligned with an opportunity that we felt could help people like you expand, mm -hmm. felt like we could create a good employment opportunity for our employees and kitchens. Mm -hmm. And then on the guest side too, you know, just seeing the, the kind of lack of selection in the suburbs, feeling like we could bring great food out there. Yep. Um, and then the last thing probably mix and match was, you know, I always thought, like on Amazon, you know, you could get a basketball, rain boots, all in the same box. Mm -hmm. And why doesn't that exist for food, you know? Mm. Um, and then really learned, this is the thing that shocked me once we opened, is like families were actually going to like two or three different restaurants because one yep. kid wanted this, another kid wanted that. I mean, in mm -hmm. my day, that's not how it went down, but. Um, <laughs> you just go wherever your parents wanted you to go, right? <laughs> yeah, if you want to eat, you can eat. And then if not, you know, that's your call. Um but yeah, it all just aligned. And then, you know, we're, we're here today and just trying to trying to grind it out and, you know, see if we can build a big company and help a lot of people along the way. Yeah. So local kitchens, um, you know, like I'm from a food truck background. So what you're kind of talking about is, you know, families come to like one of our events where there's 10 different food trucks. Hey, if the kids want a snow cone, or falafel, they could go get that. If the, you know, if the parents want, you know, a chicken sandwich or, you know, like some a bulgogi bowl, they could go there. But you guys came up with local kitchens. What is local kitchens? So it's it's that, but in one restaurant. So you have one building with, let's say, 10, 12 different restaurants inside of it. And so mm -hmm. we we cook everything. We use our staff. So, mm -hmm. you know, we take your brand, we learn everything from you, you approve all the uh, quality controls and all that. We send you reports to make sure it's, it's just as good as how your staff does it. Mm -hmm. um, and then, yeah, we have it all in the same kitchen. So, you know, we're using equipment for multiple brands. Um, and then you can come in and order off any, any menu you want. You can get a chicken sandwich from you guys or 
you know, you get a burrito from someone else. Um, it's totally up to you. Yeah. So, you know, um, I, I didn't hear from, I didn't hear of you until maybe a year ago. And it was like a cold call kind of thing. And for some reason, cause I get these all goddamn day, Andrew. Congrats. And, yeah. <laughs> and then, you know, for some reason I saw a micro food hall and the reason I really, um, uh, reach back out was because I was supposed to open up several food hall concepts before the pandemic. Were you guys already thinking about this concept before the pandemic or was it like, look around, all these food halls are closing down because, you know, because of the pandemic. And then you guys were like, let's pivot and kind of just do this. Or was this always the plan? So I'll be honest. When I, when John and I started talking about building a company, I'd been through many successes and many failures Mm -hmm. and what I learned was like, you know, you could pick your passion and say, I love like ice skating. You know, I want to have a ice skating company, but I think it's just really limiting. And ultimately you need to look for opportunity. And so I told John straight up, look, I will, any company you want to do, I'll do it. As long as it's not like selling cigarettes or something that just straight up is just bad. Mm -hmm. Um, and so he loves food and, and I do too, of course, for, for a lot of reasons, you know, the market's really, really big. You think about like supply chain and how can we be more sustainable? And, mm-hmm. you know, I, there's some crazy stat. I don't remember the number. It's like 10, 15% of the country works like in a, the food industry in a restaurant or in some capacity. And so it's like, it's an awesome space, you know, and then to add, like, if you've ever been in a kitchen, it's one of the most fun places you'll ever be with some of the coolest people you'll ever meet. So it's like, it's an industry that really draws you in. So we kind of started there, like, all right, let's do something in food. There's tons of opportunity here. And we were looking at supply chain and um, we didn't see a very clear opportunity there. Um, and then we just started talking to the local restaurants and expansion was the thing that was the biggest pain point. Like mm-hmm. seeing really good restaurants that are doing, let's say 3 million in annual sales. Mm-hmm. And you're like, man, people would dream for those sales how come we only have two locations, you mm-hmm. know? And then we just kept getting the same answer, which was, look, every time I open a brick and mortar, I don't see my family for, you know, nine to 12 months. Um, and so we realized there's these people who are incredible entrepreneurs who are like super creative, but maybe not as strong, like in terms of scale and operationally, mm-hmm. like they're strong operators and that their units run really, really well. Mm-hmm. But for whatever reason, running like 20 locations, um, it's just a different skill set than like creating a brand like you did. So we felt like, well, look, we don't know how to create brands. That's not what we would do. Mm -hmm. Um, But we think we can run them and we think we can scale them. And so that's kind of how we landed on it. And then honestly, we just got really lucky. The first, one of the first people we talked to Ari at prop chicken Mm -hmm. um, was just really kind and helped us. And I mean, he kicked us out the door a couple of times, but we, we kept coming back with different iterations of it. Mm-hmm. And um, what you learn in food is all these people are so entrepreneurial. They don't mm-hmm. they don't forget what it was like when they were trying to sell their first sandwich or whatever. And so there's like a mutual respect of, look, we're just like some people trying to start something and we're not getting paid right now. And, mm-hmm. you know, we're going to do right by you. You know, and I think at that stage, that's kind of your only value prop is like, look, we're just going to work every single day super hard. Mm-hmm. we don't have like tons of resources but we can promise you we'll like take good care of your brand you know so that's kind of how it all got started yeah so this podcast we talked to a lot of uh business owners and one thing that kind of stuck out what you just said was it's a hard fucking work and you might not get paid you know what i mean like people don't understand that about owning your own business i, I tell people all the time you know, my first concept on the food truck was Cecil's Taste. I didn't pay myself for two years. I was lucky enough to have a wife to hold me down for those two years. But, you know, like it gets to a point where you're just like, what am I doing this for? But you just have that passion. You have your drive. And that's pretty much all you could really rest on at that point. But I do want to back up because you said startup in the beginning. And, um, I didn't know about startups until 
I went to uh, San Francisco for culinary school and my buddy Henry, uh, he was from San Carlos and he started talking to me about, you know, how he was in startups after college. Can you tell the people out there the difference between a startup company and like a, you know, a restaurant per se? Well, yeah, that's a, that's a good question. I think, I don't know if we, I, I guess I should look up the definition of a startup at some point since I've been doing this shit so long. Yeah. Um, broadly, I bet a startup is probably any, it's just like anything that starts from zero, right? Yeah. Like it could be a car wash or a lemonade stand or mm -hmm. whatever. And then now in the world, I think a startup um, maybe means you're trying to do something big. Like we know it as like Amazon was a startup, Netflix mm -hmm. was a startup, DoorDash was a startup. Um, so I don't know if it more refers to the stage, like mm -hmm. is DoorDash a startup anymore? Like, well, it's public, so maybe not, Yeah. but, the, but culturally probably a lot of it is. Um, so I don't know if there's a huge difference. I mean, I think it definitely takes the same amount of work and oh, yeah. effort. <laughs> yeah. What, what is your background in? Are you, you like an engineer or what, what, how, how did you get here? <laughs> Just like just like grinding and labor yeah. love that fucking uh, question bro <laughs> yeah that's my usually background. my question or my answer <laughs> yeah mine is in um operation so you know i think mostly just someone that's been kind of type a and organized and someone that if there's a goal to be hit like i'll hit it um and then really hanging my hat on kind of like work ethic and um structure mm -hmm. like if you want to meet someone that you know wakes i wake up at the same time every day like saturday sunday it doesn't matter i feel like my thing is i have kind of um supreme abil ability to like adhere mm -hmm. like and, and to shut everything else out like i have no problem rejecting dinner plans or something social or like i have a goal and i have complete tunnel vision you know mm -hmm. um and it can be to the detriment of my personal life and it is often um, but I'm not someone that I think was, I definitely have a lot of gifts, but I'm not like the smartest person in the room or anything like that. And so at some point you just look at life and, and really think about what you have and who you are and how you can succeed. Mm -hmm. And then you create a path on what can I beat people at What's my competitive advantage. And then you kind of just go all in at that. Um, yeah. and then the last thing I think is just assembling teams. Like, like John is probably like the perfect um one of the perfect partners for me because we're opposites in a lot of ways but mm -hmm. we're, we're together in the way we want to do things mm -hmm. you know but in terms of skills um you know we we don't have too much overlap which i think is, is important okay no that's that's great man and i i think this is why michelle put us together because i'm totally like you i'm like i wasn't good in school you know, like, I don't know why the fuck I'm where I'm at. You know, like, all I do is I get up and go. That's what I tell people. I like, I get up and I just go. And I, I might fall asleep that night. I might not. But, you know, this is just what I'm, I'm just on this trajectory. I don't know where it's going to end. But, you know, like, I just have this path in mind. But one thing I will tell you, you know, like, I, I know, you know, you said, you know, your personal life, like, falls to the wayside. Just get that self-care and I see you drinking your water, whatever you got in there. So it kind of seems like, you know, you are taking care of yourself. You're an athlete. So, you know, I'm sure you take care of all that stuff. The personal stuff would come later, you know, like <laughs> when, when you yeah. get to wherever the fuck you feel comfortable with. But um, self-care, mental care, big things for me. Um, with yeah, look, I would say. Yeah. I, on, the, on that vein, I would say I, I sleep eight hours every night. I work out an hour every day. I there think um, I'm probably one of the healthiest people you'll meet. Mm -hmm. It's more, I don't engage in like, um, I almost forgot the word because I don't use it like acquaintances. Uh, oh, there you go. <laughs> like, I just, if you're not my mom or my girlfriend or, or local kitchens, um, it's pretty unlikely that there's time for you. Yeah, she put us together for a reason. She listened to a couple of these podcasts, brother. Uh, <laughs> uh, all right, so I want to, I wanna, where did Local Kitchens, where was your first 
local kitchen. Um, what was your first opening? Well, what was kind of crazy is we signed Prop Chicken. They wanted to go live like the next week. We didn't have a kitchen or anything. We were just three. It was me, Jordan, and John. You know, we were just three um, tech people, I guess is how you would call us. And I was actually on a road trip at that time because it was during the pandemic. We were going to start the company in like October or November. Um, and I was going to come back from this road trip, but then they signed them in August or something like that. Um, and so basically we found another kitchen who would cook prop chickens food because we couldn't just start a kitchen in like a week mm -hmm. right even even being naive tech people like we knew like there was probably some permits or some shit that um we would need that might take more than a week you know yeah <laughs> so we found this this kitchen in menlo park um and they had laid off some staff and they had extra capacity because it was mid pandemic and we just mm -hmm. said hey we'll we'll teach you how to cook this other company's food you know, and you can sell it and we'll pay you, right? It's, it's not that different. You know, you guys can do it. And this guy, totally entrepreneurial, um, he was just like, yeah, like, let's do it. Um, so we started with that and we thought that might be what we do. But then, you know, we learned, like, we had this idea that multi-brand ordering and the food hall thing, a digital food hall thing would be a big deal. Mm -hmm. um, and ultimately, we wanted to control everything. We wanted to control the hours, like, the interactions with the guests and all that stuff and so we decided hey let's build our own kitchen you know and so then we found this kitchen in lafayette mm -hmm. in east bay okay uh, and we didn't really build much out it's still it was a um i don't know if you've heard of the cheesecake the cheese steak shop yeah yeah i think we got one on watt avenue yeah um it was one of those and so it still very much looked like that on the inside when people came in mm -hmm. and we basically just wanted to see if we put six brands in a kitchen what would happen you know would it sell um and then it did and then we like we did some construction and kind of just kept kept going from there there you go man uh, you, you you're talking like a real business man <laughs> just get out there and just do the shit you know you, it works I mean, it you works have to just, it tweak yeah, as you, you go i think you could talk yourself out of every idea i mean i could probably give you like 15 legitimate ideas or opinions on why we never should have done this. And mm -hmm. they're all probably really smart and good, mm -hmm. but I think you have to just try to do things like an idea is so worthless. So you have to just go see, you know, do people want this? And the only way to do that is to actually like test it out. Right. There's, there's so many people who they'll be like, Oh, I got this idea, but I don't really want to tell you about it because you might steal it. And it's like, your idea is fucking worthless. Like, <laughs> Every, I remember one of my mentors said, everyone on this earth is walking around with a million dollar idea. Mm -hmm. And I believe that too. I really do believe that. But they don't do shit. And so yeah. it just, you, you have to just go test it out. There's so much we learned from trying things that like we never would have known. You know, you just, you learn this stuff. Like would a brand even trust us to cook their food? I don't know. Let's yeah. just see. Can we even cook their food? We told them we could. Let's, can we do it? Like, you know, yeah, and it turns out we can do all this stuff. Yeah, you know, like I, you know, I tell a lot of my uh, business partners, and they, they, you know, when they get into that negative space, I'm like, just say yes, and let's just work through it. Like, why are we saying no? You know, like, why are we backing off of, you know, like a, like you said, a million dollar idea? Like, let's just try. It. If the shit don't work, then we go to the next idea. But yeah. just sitting here looking at each other ain't really doing nothing either. So you know, like, yeah hitting the nail on the head so there, um, there's a there's this idea that if you if you think you can't do it then you're right and if you think you can do it you're also right yeah yeah what, what's it gonna hurt it's like you know i'm sure you know like you guys with the cold emails that you're sending out how many times did somebody just say no or not respond but it didn't stop you you know <laughs> <laughs> just, yeah you know probably just got lost in their inbox we're just, yeah this you know, guy, like, yeah <laughs> move on to the next one maybe nash and proper a call back you know like <laughs> so hey uh, i want to get to roseville because when you think about the sacramento area yeah roseville is one of the prominent areas but it's not where people are like i'm going to sacramento to roseville but roseville is very close-knit 
They like their they like their restaurants out there. They don't leave Roseville. Why did you pick Roseville out of anywhere that you could have went next? Because this is your first um, uh, north of the Bay Area that you guys are going, right? That's right. Why Roseville? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, I think you explained a lot of it. It is like it's a tight knit community of people that kind of hang out around there. And we have this dynamic of bringing the best from cities to the suburbs. So mm -hmm. we've seen, and I think it's common all over America that younger people in their twenties, let's say they live in a city because they want to be downtown and they want to be near work and all that. And then at some point you get older, you want to buy a house, you want more space, um, you want to have kids and the suburbs make more sense. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, in a lot of situations, like the suburbs is kind of the American dream, right? Like you, should be so lucky to be able to go live in the suburbs but i think people miss their city life you know they miss being close to everything and they miss the high quality of food that exists in cities and so roseville kind of made perfect sense because it's close to sacramento um and we do feel like it's a demographic that will really appreciate this high quality food that we can bring yeah and um i, I was telling michelle because I, I went out and talked to her uh, a couple weeks ago i was like you guys got like a prime spot because you're in the middle of Roseville and Rockland. So you guys could get those guys stumbling out of Thunder Valley. You know, like you could get top golf people that didn't like that crappy ass food out there, you know? So, so totally. you guys, you guys are in like, you, I don't know if you stumbled upon it, but I was like, this is a great location that you guys got here. Did, did you guys know what you were walking into there? I think we knew some of it. Um, you know, we, we've decided to be open till 2 a.m. Thursday, Friday, Saturday for, you know, those couple places you mentioned yep. that are kind of open that late. I think that's another big gap in the suburbs is the actual hours of operation. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a big, big value to someone like you. Like, you don't want to worry about a staff at, you know, 1 a.m. or midnight, right? But we're happy to take that headache on for you and pump some sales. <laughs> Okay, so um, why Nash and Profit? Well, well, why did you guys reach out? Like, why did we get this far? You know, because as you said, you have Prospect Chicken on your roster. Why us? I mean, I think there's a couple things that go into it. Number one is just like sales, right? Like, does the food sell? That's like the most important thing. You know, we're not in a position where local kitchens is this huge brand, right? Like, maybe that'll switch at some point but um right now you know we want brands that are recognizable that that people have heard of and so you'd imagine a lot of people from roseville probably come to get national proper right they've probably had it they've experienced it um so that's important um, and then the partnership side right like i think people that are have high standards they want to go big but they have some flexibility like we you know you talk to matt we work through the menu it's not someone that's so rigid that says, look, it can only be this way. And, mm -hmm. and we want to hold your brand integrity and we will, but someone that is like kind of in it to win it and that we can actually work with. Like if things go bad, like I want to not go bad, but if there's some quality issue, I want to be able to call you and say, Hey, look, here's the problem. Here's what we're doing to fix it. This is the mm -hmm. date at which it will be fixed. And I want to collaborate. You know, mm -hmm. I don't want you to be like, well, you guys suck and I'm going to pull it and, 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 you, and you should do that if we do suck. Um, mm -hmm. But someone that is just kind of like entrepreneurial and, you know, down to grow it together. Because it's new for us too, right? We're a year and a half old company. Like mm -hmm. we're, we're learning a lot. So I think those dynamics are ones that we feel really drawn to. Um, yeah. But first it's the products. Like you can check Yelp, you can check Instagram. Like this is, this is a product that people are fanatical about, you know, and we, we want to be a part of that. And I honestly, I feel privileged to, to be a part of it. I think, thank you so much for having us. And, you know, you, you kind of glossed over the chef Matt part of this whole thing, the pedigree on this dude, I'll let you, I'll let you talk about him because when she, when Michelle said, where this guy's pedigree was from. I was like, yes, I'll give him my recipes. <laughs> you know, you can, you know. <laughs> so talk, talk a little bit about Chef Matt on your team. Cause I got Man. a Chef Matt, my, my director of operations 
is Chef Matt as well. But talk about your Chef Matt. Man, Matt, Matt is this guy that's like just one of the most impressive people you'll ever meet from kind of every different angle. So Matt, you know, grew up in Philly. And I don't know if you've met many people from Philly, but I've learned that they're very tough people. It yes. might be the, the weather. I don't know what it is, but they're the mean. four or five people. <laughs> they're yeah, mean from Philly. <laughs> it's just, there's a separate kind of, actually Ari, the um, founder of, of um, Proposition Chicken was is from Philly too. Mm. Uh, there's just like a, a grind in these people so you know went to high school like didn't go to college like went straight into the workforce right he started working at restaurants you know uh, my words not his I think he fell in love with food and the industry um, and grinded it out I know he was living somewhere pretty far from Manhattan probably taking the train in for years and years and years I think he told me his there's a time where he was making like I think 400 bucks a week or something and, um, you know, he thought it was pretty good because it was money in his pocket. Mm -hmm. uh, and he just worked his way up, right? Line cook, like head chef. And now this guy has cooked in, you know, Michelin star restaurants. He worked with David Chang and was his right-hand man for, you know, five, 10 years, something mm -hmm. like that. And so he's unique in that he, he can run a restaurant. He deeply understands the, the P&L and he can go through an accounting statement as a complete expert. He can cook any food. As a matter of fact, I had him over for 4th of July like a year ago. And him and his wife just just absolutely threw down. Like mm. just some of the literally the best chicken I've had in my life. Like oh, just, wow. just everything was so insane. You know, it's not like, oh, your friend cooked. It's like, no, 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 like your friend Matt cooked. Like <laughs> um, so and and he came over with like bus trays and all this stuff, right? This is this you look at this man's equipment, like this is not a game. Like, yeah this, this man is a professional and so um such a unicorn like our first kitchen actually we had this little kitchen before lafayette which was in san jose matt moved out from philadelphia and was running the kitchen every day opening and closing it so he had, was living in new york where he had no commute mm -hmm. comes out here living in san francisco buys a car he's driving to and from san jose seven days a week opening at 8 a.m., closing at 10 p.m., driving an hour each way. And this is, like, so far below where he was at. He was running, like, 10 restaurants in a restaurant group. And mm -hmm. now he's, like, the kitchen manager training people. So just humility, grit, expertise, like, he's just – we we owe him everything. You know, he's just – he's the GOAT. Like, there's just no way to put it. Yeah, good dude, man. Uh, yeah, very thorough. Um, yeah, I, I've had, you know, a great experience working with them. The, you know, him and him and my chef, Matt, uh, work together the most. But just the interaction with them, I'm just like, dude, oh, man, this, you guys went out and got you a real one right there for sure. Uh, <laughs> all right. Um, so tell, tell us about the other restaurants that are going to be coming to uh, Roseville. So in Roseville, I think we're launching with Curry Up Now. Um, Senior Seasig is going up there. Mm -hmm. um, there's Garden of Eden, which is another Sacramento brand. Okay. Um, and then we're doing kind of a, a launch with those, and then we're going to do some construction to expand the kitchen. And then three months after that, we'll probably bring three or four others. Okay. How, what's the max that you think you could get up in Roseville? Mm -hmm. It might be like 10, okay. but I always feel like we can get creative. Like we might be able to do grab and go sushi. Maybe mm -hmm. we can fit in our 11th. Um, okay. I think we'd love to maybe bring in some trucks every now and then and say, oh, this Friday night, we actually have an additional. Um, so, you know, we're pretty creative. And I think I, I actually have worked in a lot of kitchens as a, a buster and a server and all this kind of stuff. But it's kind of a non, well, I guess I wouldn't say a non-restaurant person since now we run this company, but we think outside the box like if i see space up here i'm like well what could we put up there like could, yep. could we like hang an oven or something <laughs> and you know matt will tell us like what's what's possible and what's not yeah um, but we will get creative that's for sure oh yeah I'm, I'm one of those guys that see some space and i'm like we need another shelf there's, <laughs> there's enough room for a shelf up there <laughs> yeah uh so what what's the concept moving forward how big do you want this to be where, where are you moving to next? Like, what, what's the, what's the future of local kitchens? 
yeah, we want to be huge. You know, I think one way we think of it is, well, two ways, I guess. You know, our, our mission right now, like mission statement is we want to launch 2,000 kitchens. Okay. And so that's one way to think of it. Another could be maybe market cap. You want to be like 30 billion, 40 billion. I think of like a Chipotle or, you know, one of those large companies. And then I think speed matters. You know, we want to do it in, you know, five to seven years instead of 30 to 50. So yeah. understanding so, how we can scale quick. A year and a half. How many of these do you have? We have five excluding Roseville, which launches in a couple weeks. Jeez, you guys are working. But even that feels, honestly, I feel like we've had some tough luck and we, we should probably be at eight right now. Mm -hmm. And I think we probably have maybe over 50 LOIs out right now. Yeah. So I, I think it will compound, you know, the thing that we learned is just the lead time on kitchens. And it's not like normal software business where you can just, like in DoorDash, we could just launch any city anytime mm -hmm. because the restaurant's already there. You just needed drivers and then you try to get customers. Mm -hmm. um, so we're kind of learning the way this game is played and we're, we're adapting and, um, you know, we're going to try to maintain speed. Are you guys trying to work on a platform for yourself or are you still going to be using the DoorDash and the Uber Eats and things like that? Hot topic. <laughs> this is because I always think about it. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. We've, we haven't talked about it too much. Um, I think there's definitely a world where you could do something like that. I think maybe you could do something supplemental, maybe during peak, you might have some of your own staff to do some deliveries. Mm -hmm. um, so we'll see. I think we always anchor from the guest. Like what does the guest want? What can we, what value can we bring to them? And then, you know, our work is kind of dictated from there. Well, cool, man. You ready? You ready for some top five, bro? Yeah, yeah. All right. Uh, are you familiar with the Sacramento area? Loosely. Okay, so we're gonna do your top five restaurants of all time. In in Sacramento? No, it doesn't have to be Sacramento. Okay, Just where? Yeah. Oh. All right. So there's one in San Francisco called Spruce. It's like basically like white tablecloth which is not my style but mm -hmm. the level of operations and service there is insane and i always like kind of a, a pro trip pro tip for the um the frugal folks is just go there and get the burger it's on the bar menu it's like 24 bucks so instead of spending like 100 bucks you can just slide in there and, and get that burger but i could go in there in sweatpants and a hat it doesn't matter they just treat you like royalty and they're just always on point you know like they never never miss a step um right now my favorite pizza in the city is probably fiorella they have a couple couple locations in the city that's really good um there's one called la mediterranean which is on mm. fillmore in the city mm -hmm. that's always been one of my favorites um oh there's one in the richmond district called sushi bistro okay that's that's probably my favorite sushi. I've been going there for probably 10 or more years. Um, and then ooh, the fifth one. I have to go Mexican. There's a place called um, El Buen, Taqueria El Buen Sabor in the Mission. Okay. I, I think it's, maybe it's a sleeper, but I think it's the best burrito in the city, hands down. I tell you what, if you if you stumble upon the mission, any of those taquerias, oh yeah. my god, I it's I could spend the whole there. fucking day in there, bro. Yeah, <laughs> we should do it. You can come down, let's do it. Oh, you know, I, I was just there last two weekends. Um, yeah, I had a I don't know if you ever heard it's a sushi spot uh, called Juni. Probably the best experience I've had in a long time. J U dash N I. And it's cool. just a tasting menu, just flawless, like a 12 course, just one biters, just boom, boom, boom. Yeah. This hit on all, all oh, points. I, I, I saw that on your Instagram. That yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? yeah. Yeah. I just had that. Me and my wife went over the weekend, uh, got like the last two spots outside. The chef owner was out there. Just amazing experience. Yeah. It looks crazy. Okay. Um, <laughs> Your type top five neighborhood spots growing up or right now? To eat? 
Uh, it doesn't have to be to eat, just what you what you do on a normal or mm. yeah. yeah, yeah. So there's um well we used <laughs> all right, so this is growing up, so it's so I've I've changed for sure, but um we used to go to Stonestown a lot in the sunset. It's a mall in San Francisco after school, and we would get a lot of Sabaro pizza and a lot of Panda Express. And in high school, that, that was kind of the shit. Um, there was a sandwich called Submarine Center um, mm. in West Portal that was really, really good. Um, There's another one actually kind of in the middle of the city called Roxy's. It's like a, this exists in San Francisco and in New York where a lot of liquor stores actually have really good delis. Yep. And Roxy's is, is one of them. Um, I used to love Taco Bell when I was little, for sure. Mm. I was I was definitely on the people that were devastated when they were moving Mexican pizza. Um, it's coming back though. Is it? Yeah, I heard somebody somebody put on social media it's coming back. So I I still need the the green onion though. I, I hate that yeah. they got rid of the green onion. But and you know, the, E. coli is running uh really rampant and that's green onion. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll say my my fifth one is probably the soccer field like grew up playing soccer and that's the place where I felt the most comfortable and the most happy and where I would want to spend most of my time and actually the place Roxy's was across the street from one of the fields that I kind of grew up playing on and um, yeah that was my shit for sure yeah I, I played soccer for 16 years and I got to like high school um, I think my junior year and I was just like, ah, there ain't no girls around here. So I quit, <laughs> but it was, a, I was, you know, I was a really good goalkeeper and yeah, just, I, I kind of gravitated towards uh basketball and, and, uh, yeah. baseball after that. Um, but no, nah, this has been dope, man, but we got, we got our coming in hot segment. So this is the segment that you could get anything off your chest. You could talk about politics you could talk about local kitchens a little bit more you could talk about whatever you want religion andrew monday it is time to come in hot what you got so like a hot a hot take you could do whatever you want right now man man um I mean, we probably align on this. I, so, well, one thing that could be interesting, I don't read the news. I stopped reading the news like maybe like six to nine months ago. As I heard, there was this theory that if if there's something that you need to know, like you'll know it, like someone will just tell you about it. And especially during COVID, like it was just so much negative shit of, and when you really like look at the news, you just see how negative it is. And I'm I'm an optimist. You have to be if you're, doing something like this um and i felt like this is kind of making me dumber and it's also like a waste of time like in the first 30 minutes of the day like you know i could be reading a book or doing anything else and i feel like oftentimes when i tell people i don't really like tell people this because it doesn't really come up but it comes up if they bring some current event up and i'm like i don't know what the fuck you're talking about mm-hmm. um and so maybe it's kind of controversial, but I think it's been awesome, you know, and it, it totally does work out. Like I, I, I learn about something like the San Francisco school board just got voted out. And so I knew this election was coming up because people talked about it mm-hmm. and then I could just go research it on my own terms, mm-hmm. right. Instead of someone telling me or, yeah. or the Ukraine, Russia stuff. Um, you know, I'd heard about it and then I just Googled like, why is Russia invading Ukraine? You know, mm-hmm. and I can kind of sift through and, um so it's it's been great like i i was a little uneasy about it because i felt like it might make me i don't know like a worse citizen or people think i'm irresponsible or something but um it's been fucking awesome i don't know if everyone can do it like that would be a bad thing because because then some people wouldn't you know the people who told me about these current events are the ones who read the news so like if everyone didn't read it how would it go but um yeah, I don't know. That's what I've been thinking about. Oh, that was hot, man. And, you know, like I I, I had a similar situation. I, I still watch the news a little bit, but I got sucked into the election shit. <laughs> and I woke up, went to sleep with CNN on like all all day, all night. 
and at the very end and you know like i'm not a political person by any means but by the end i was like i felt duped you know so i was like <laughs> yeah. I, I can't do this anymore you know like i spent literally like a month of my life you know with the damn news on because remember like the election was over and it went on for three weeks afterwards yeah. Yeah. so yeah I, i'm with you i could have been doing so much more with that time so yeah that was hot i don't think it was a hot take i think it was just the fucking truth bro <laughs> that's that's how i think about most of it is like like yeah we have this question in our for for new employees who come to our company we ask them what's one thing you believe that most people disagree with um and i always feel like if i had to answer that it would be most of the shit i think um probably would fall into that category yeah <laughs> <laughs> hey man i right. thank you so much for being on uh go ahead and give us all your socials how they could find local kitchens uh it's your, your time to shine yeah i think really probably just linkedin i think we should probably do more there and i think that's the place where a lot of business owners i don't know if you're active on there but i feel like it's it's a context different than twitter and instagram that it, people keep it a little more professional i think mm -hmm. there's still a lot of you know, stupid shit on there. But um, I think that's probably where we want to connect the most with people because we can highlight the company. I'd love to put videos and images on there. And, mm -hmm. you know, we're recruiting all day. And so I'm on there, you know, all day, every day. And that's, that's for sure the best place to, to reach me and connect. All right. What, what's your handle for your uh, website? So I think if you just look, if you just search local kitchens on LinkedIn, um, okay, that's probably probably the way to do it everything else i'm pretty quiet on i think um same with the news thing like i've been off twitter for quite a while stay stay off that shit man it's a black <laughs> hole Fucking <laughs> hey bro <laughs> yeah. hey but um thank you so much for coming on um uh, for cecil uh please don't forget to subscribe to coming in hot wherever you listen to your podcast if you want to holler at me directly at chef cease if you want to holler at the podcast at coming in hot podcast for those delicious mouth watering chicken sandwiches www.nationproper.com i'll see you next week love you peace